Hello and welcome to Raconteurs News. Um, I'm going to be filling in for Jason while he's um, convalescing, shall we say. And um, AIDS also convalescing, so there's just Andy producing and myself to do the show tonight. The date is 5th of June 2018. Um, we've got a lot to talk about tonight. Um, we've got um, a special guest on tonight from the UK column, which is Alex Thompson. I've uh, been looking forward to speaking with Alex for quite some time now. Um, what this what this guy doesn't know, <laughs> I've, got, I've got yet to find out. So, um, without further ado, Alex, you can probably put it a lot more eloquently than I can. Could you give us a, a background of, of where you've come from and where you're up to? Well, I'm uh, nearly 40, and I was at GCHQ for the first eight years of my career. Uh, 22 to age 30, so that was the years 2001 to 2009, and I was a specialist there in Eastern Europe. And uh, before that time, I'd lived in the former Soviet Union, and before that, I'd done a degree in a weird and wonderful subject at Cambridge called Anglo-Saxon, Norse, and Celtic. Wow. And before that, I was at public school, although I was not for one of the public school families. I got a scholarship there, so uh, I rubbed shoulders with the uh, sons and grandsons of the uh, great and not so good. Mm. And then uh, I got discharged with GCHQ. In fact, when I was vetted age 22, I told the vetting officer there's certain red lines that will uh, make me leave, and I, I could see them approaching. So happily, a Dutch girl came into the picture in 2007, and within two years of meeting her, I moved over here to the Netherlands, and we subsequently married, and I've lived here ever since, happily with her being a freelance translator and interpreter. Beautiful. Very well summed up. See, I wouldn't have put it that eloquent. <laughs> so... Uh, you've been, you were just saying uh, before we came on Earth that you spent a couple of weeks back over in Britain. Yes. Because you've got, you've got, I know there's a lot of cases um, that are being worked. I mean, um, through um, Eddie from the, Eddie Elder from the UK column and Justin, I've been put in touch with some people, um, including John Wedger as well. I've, I've been put in touch with uh, people that, who are interested in the stuff that I, you know, the work that I've done. So, I think there's a, a lot going on. So, can you can you give us a a bit you know bit of background into what um, what cases they are? I know obviously you're not going to go into it too much, but just you know tell the tell the viewers what is going on because, as you were saying, the the alternative media, which is basically mainstream, isn't it these days? I mean, we've, we've people aren't going looking for BBC and things like that now. And as you were saying, we seem to be a victim of our own success. So what, um, what are you up to? What uh, is going on with that? Well, UK Column News, for those who aren't aware, uh, started off locally in Devonport, the Royal Navy base, now in a sad state of disrepair in Plymouth. In fact, uh, Brian Gerrish started it there because he came ashore, having served in the Royal Navy and gone up to Lieutenant Commander Grade. And uh, he came ashore in 1993 and was a city businessman in Plymouth. Uh, that's with a small c, a businessman in the city, nothing to do with the city of London. Although they are part of the uh, grief he suffered later on. But, uh, maybe we'll come to that another time. Yeah. But uh, So what uh, he noticed was that there was deliberate wrecking of the chances of young people to have careers in these depressed former military and ex-industrial areas. And he got nasty stuff happening to him. And so his first focus was uh, against a group he was tipped off about being at the source of his woes, which was called Common Purpose. Yeah. I don't know if you have any uh, foreign listeners who might not be aware of it, but it's been variously described as a left-wing secular version of the Freemasons yeah. or as a British version of Phi Beta Kappa. It ropes in the new elite because every regime needs an elite. And we used to do it through, well, my route, really, public school in Oxbridge and the Church of England and so on. But I could see that network dying in my time and not being taken seriously. So Common Purpose takes uh, people who are basically, uh, well, in the old days, they would have said they have no class and no breeding and make something of them. You see, uh, give them a loyalty to each other that trumps all else. Often they use neuro-linguistic programming, or I should say misapply it because it can be used benignly as well. Uh, and it's often a front for Satanism and child abuse. Uh, I, I have to use my words carefully. There's many people in common work purpose who have no affili affiliation with either of those wicked practices, but many who do, uh, more than you might think, and often NLP is one of the fronts for that. So Brian, before I came on the scene, was reporting locally and then nationally on this kind of fraud and corruption in local government, the stitch-ups between various agencies uh, of government and public life, like the police, the courts, and so on. 
Uh, by the time I came on the scene helping him in 2013, uh, we had got much more of an international focus. We were looking at the use of the Commonwealth, the use of the EU to bring about agendas which nestle in the city of London and in the secret societies that Britain excels in. And so my focus is on the European continent, but I've always helped in UK column casework for the victims of state-sponsored child abuse, which is a massive, massive problem <coughs> that Britain has. Yeah. Uh, I've particularly helped <coughs> in a very large northeast of Scotland story. We had the Doherty files. Um, yeah. The transcript is, uh, no longer, is no longer on the front of the website due to the request of the, uh, the persecuted couple involved who lost their children to this. But they, they were persecuted through both jurisdictions in Ireland, yeah. Northern Ireland and the Republic, um, by a Scottish-based group of... Um, well, again, the secret affiliations and uh, in many cases their own people had been parachuted into power, even in the Republic of Ireland, especially in Tusla, the Child Protection Agency. Uh, but that started on the estate of a minor royal. The um, It was the Viscount um, Petersham's estate, Crim and Mogate, and I must stress he himself is not personally implicated in any of this. Uh, but there are questions about what he knew, perhaps. Um, so what happened there was um, a man who was later discovered uh, to be, uh, despite the lies of Police Scotland, he was discovered to be a serving uh, policeman with Police Scotland on the estate called Alan Lowe, with distinguishing marks which corroborated his um, uh, that it was him, uh, approached the Doherty's who were uh, lodged uh, on the Crim and Mogate estate, rented a house there and said, give me, 25, uh, give me your uh, disabled four-year-old son for £25,000 next Friday night. This is an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> and this was uh, the, the, the laird of that estate, the, the landlord uh, from which they both rented, was Viscount Petersham, uh, who is the Queen's um, nephew's uh, brother-in-law, if I got that right. <laughs> yes, Viscount Lily is Lindley, Lindsley is, sorry, Lindley is the Queen's nephew, and um, Viscount Petersham is his brother-in-law, married to uh, Viscount Lindley's sister, the um, um, uh, supermodel, I believe, Serena. Really? I may have got some of those details wrong, but uh, that's the outline of it. That's the biggest story I helped with. Uh, with some other volunteers, I produced a 250-page hyperlinked transcript describing exactly what had happened in this story, incredible as it may seem, and how it all went back to Edinburgh and London. Um, and probable MI5 involvement. And I never thought I'd get to the day where I'd say my old colleagues uh, were involved, but one or two seem to have been, for certain. But uh, I have to, having said that, the, the worst wickedness seems to be that there's nominated policemen in every part of the British Isles, even in the Republic of Ireland, which we supposedly don't have power over, um, who answer to a corrupt network in London, the same people who go around asset stripping. And that's taken me to other major cases. The one we're currently campaigning on most is Peter Hofschroer, H-O-F-S-C-H-R-O-E-R. -E if people are minded to make a small donation, he has got a legal fund that needs, uh, he and his mother Barbara uh, need. Uh, people can find all the details to save time by going to, uh, if they search for Leachy, L-E-E-T-C-H-I, and then add to that word Leachy, his name, H-O-F-S-C-H-R-O-E-R. In brief, this is a man and his very elderly mother coming up to 90 who have both been incarcerated by a combination of social services and mental institutions, although they have no, no problems with them, uh, because in the first instance their house was desirable, and in the second instance they campaigned too hard against it and rubbed up against the successors of Jimmy Savile in the Satanist Network of North Yorkshire. So that's basically what I spend my time doing, and I use my background as a committed Christian and as, as a student of history, really, to work out whose loyalties lie where, and uh, why it's sometimes inexplicably people have got these, uh, these oath-bound loyalties to each other across public services and even across the whole continent of Europe. That, that's always been um, one of the debates, isn't it? How can you have somebody who's taking a public office swearing an oath to people who, you know, to a secret society? And it seems to be, I don't know if you've noticed, but certainly in the last five years, uh, even the last 10 years, everybody who's ever secret societies, Freemasons, yeah, yeah, conspiracy theory and everything. I've noticed the word theory is being dropped and it's a conspiracy because you can't keep looking at something and seeing the same names, the same faces, and not come to a conclusion that you only need two for a conspiracy. There's more than two. There's a definite conspiracy going on at every level. You was mentioning the police and public sector. The public sectors have been destroyed, absolutely destroyed. Common Purpose was one of the main instigators of that, but how they've now uh, positioned themselves 
they've the, the mask is off you know the, the blatantly out front now when we were talking about the corruption um i got involved in this through um, the courts who wanted to take my house now uh, I, I wasn't um it wasn't to do with uh, funds or anything like that i was paying mortgages but I, at the end of the day my ex wanted to sell the house and i said well i don't care what she does with her property i'm not selling mine so if she sold her half it, you know there's nothing i could do about that alex but i knew she wouldn't be able to sell it now it wasn't me being um it wasn't you know bad feelings or anything we'd split up quite amicably but the house was mine i'd inherited it it wasn't something we'd bought together so you know because her son was stealing from her it put us into a position where i had to go to court i asked one question alex what jurisdiction is the judge standing under today to claim authority over me and my property in this county court without my consent four minutes later armed police attended I was then summoned into a court with two armed police in front of me, two behind me and one either side of me, and a police sergeant asking my friends, does anybody know why we're here? And then over the next five hearings, I had video evidence gatherers, arms, police, over 30 coppers. And all I was saying, Alex, was, I don't want to sell my house. So I saw the corruption right there and then, right in front of me. They told me, this is what we're doing. We're taking your property. And I said, you can't. You can't without my consent. I signed nothing, Alex, but they stole it. Now, there's definitely is the Freemasons involved in that? Of course they are. These people are Freemasons. As you were saying, maybe not everyone. Mm -hmm. And there are some good judges and good solicitors and barristers. There must be. Please, God, there must be one or two. But I saw that corruption. And as, as you were saying, it's it spread. It's like it, because we didn't have the um shall we say the technology maybe within the last 15 20 years where people communicate instantly like that before we had that it was all easy to debunk now you look at it and it's so blatantly in your face and we're sharing this information instantaneously so i ended up getting involved with all the banking side and the mortgages and the stuff that i found out alex it's just people can't understand how much they are being ripped off you know it's a debt-based economy and we keep getting told that there's a national debt every time we pay a bill and i put pay in speech marks every time you try and pay a bill you are trying to pay debt with more debt you are actually um, making every time we pay a bill, you must set this debt off with your signature and people don't understand that but that set me off on this so i've been pulled into things as well but I don't think I'd change it now. It, like you were saying, Alex, you've found something in your life. Where you've not only got the drive for it, but you've got the knowledge and you, you can articulate it. Where there's a lot of people I know who have knowledge, but they can't articulate it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the, um, the information can kind of break down because when you can't articulate something, anybody you can think on the feet can debunk you or put you on the spot type thing. And that's why I like when I've seen you on UK column, how you break it down, it's it's not um, you know, as you were saying, you've got the you've got the public school background and everything, but you don't you don't you're not from that. Do you know no, what I mean? Exactly. It's it's I wanna say like humanitarian <laughs> more, <laughs> you know. So you've got that you, you, it's that kind of information that needs to get out. And I think um, it, if you want to you know, you can look online, you can find anything out within 0.2 of a second. Those it's we live in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. If you want to still be ignorant and you still want to keep getting ripped off and not even know why, because I still get people who say, Oh, no, I'll just I'll just keep going, I'll keep paying my bills, keep well, you're not making anything any better. So it's um, it, it's going to be interesting. Um, is 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 that all your time that is taken up now with with these cases? Have you, can you fit anything else in? Obviously, <laughs> your missus is doing the DIY. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is it. Um, I've actually uh, very fortunately come into a position where I'm self-employed and I can devote uh, time to these cases. 
Um, we don't do it for the money, that's for sure. We do very well, much welcome donations. The same is true of any alternative media outlet. We have, we've got past the point of British shame now, and we do have to be a bit more American style and say, please donate to keep this show afloat, because it is yeah. a case of that. We need, you know, Brian and Mike uh, need a full-time support, and we've got many others who are like David Scott and myself, and to some extent David Ellis with his lobbying. He's less on camera, but he's lobbying to save Britain from military union with Europe. Um, we, we spend a lot of our time doing this without you know, much hope of remuneration, so donations are very welcome. So the, the, the time I've got is really only a few hours a week, but so I guess with the presentation being once a, a week, people do often assume that I'm working, able to work on this full time. But there's, um, you know, for everyone like me who's prepared to sit in front of the camera and use the public school in Cambridge polish to, to present what's happening, there's maybe a hundred or sometimes even a thousand people in the network sluicing yeah. information our way and they are really as much UK column news as we are they are the team as well uh, throughout all kinds of communications media sometimes on more or less secret channels I get stuff uh, to me sometimes anonymously sometimes with a, a, a severe request not to use the person's name it's the same with all of the, the core team members who present and so what we present is really only a tip of an iceberg but we also try to discover a vein a seam in the material and say look put this in perspective how's it changed over time how is it similar yeah. across the country or different where are the hot spots which institutions are the problems um oh, so really that that really quickly fills the few hours a week i've got available and uh, besides that i'm just you know earning a living as a translator and interpreter so it's uh it's a, it's a job that really kind of made itself for me but the same is true of both of the Davids uh, on the broadcast and certainly the two co-editors Brian and Mike um, yeah. they, they couldn't keep silent any longer when they realized how much they'd realized exactly well I rem I'm going back 10 years or so and I remember um, going uh, when I first met first time I met Roger Hayes and he had six UK column newspapers six that's all he that's all he had and I was taking him and putting him in doctor's surgeries or dental surgeries because and, you know, I think it was, um, there was very few in bits of information in those papers. It wasn't any, you know, it was all at cost and, you know, stuff like that. But to see how far that has come now in 10 years, and the, the one thing that they can do, they can call your names, they can give you problems with your network and stuff like that. But the one thing they can't beat, Alex, is you're talking the truth. That's and it. it. And that's that, why they don't name us. Exactly. You, know, we, we, you get you get a lot of more questionable or, or rash outfits who often report a lot of good and save people from horrendous persecution, mm -hmm. uh, but they do get knocked and sometimes even shut down uh, by the establishments. But they don't dare do it with us, not yet. Although we're getting wind certainly from several directions now that um, they're going to ramp up to try and ban us all. But they're not going to do it by name. We're not going to go on a proscribed list. UK column the sinners because we are careful to be truthful in what we say and to stay on the right side of the, the, la the law of, as regards libel and slander. Um, and of course, above all, what we say is reasoned analysis and primary documents and quality people of increasing quality all the time speaking, um, or if it's witness statements, it's from the horse's mouth. Uh, if you mentioned UK column news in Parliament, which isn't going to happen, it's just going to draw the attention of a whole class of people to it. Yeah, they'll want to know, they'll, they'll be interested in what, what are these people doing? Why yeah. are they causing such a furore over, over things? But I've found in the last 10 years that rather than uh, corporates, because obviously I'm, I'd, uh, I'd spoke with uh, Roger and uh, I knew about Brian and that before the, the column even got on to uh, television. And, but it was those connections that I made, Alex, with separate people, individuals from all over the world. I'm speaking to people who are giving me brilliant information you will not get this information from a soundbite on sky or bbc or anything like that people such as yourself i mean i was what i was going into work and people were talking about um the civil war in syria i'm going there's nothing civil about that mate. this is we're funding training and arming these people do you not see this well they've not mentioned that on on the news and I'm, I'm getting my information from Vanessa Bealey and Eva Bartlett. You know, these people are on the ground, feet on the ground, and they're telling you what is happening. The Syrian people are waving flags of cheering the Syrian army, and the BBC are telling us the Syrian army are the problem. You know, it's it, it was meeting people like that. And the like I said, we, we, were, we were talking about guests. Um, we had a guy called Dave Von Kleiston who made a couple of films in the 2000s, 9-11 uh, in plain sight and 9-11 ripple effect. 
Now, the one thing that they couldn't do with him, they, he, did, he doesn't have an angle. He doesn't have a theory on what happened. He just asked questions. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, he's been off the radio. He had a, a show on the, G, the, the GCN network. He used to introduce Alex Jones in the, in the late 90s. So he'd already been there and done that. And he's, he left the country in about 2009. He's only just recently come back to America. He was a friend on Facebook, and I just pinged him an email, and as quick as you did, answered me straight away, and he come on the show, and it's I've got um, Cynthia McKinney. Cynthia oh, yeah. McKinney's coming on the show in July, uh, July August. I've got to set a date with her. Um, I've got John Wedger on next week as well. Um, so uh, he mentioned those two names together, Paul. It's a good uh, time to tell the listeners that just 24 hours ago, the uh, International Tribunal for Natural Justice, if I've got the name right, released their videos. If you go to commission.itnj.org, you will find a whole page of their video uploads, uploads. And they've made Cynthia McKinney, that brilliant woman, a commissioner. And they also took a uh, witness testimony from John Wedger as well on uh, Metropolitan Police cover-up of child abuse. And, uh, or I should say more accurately, cover-up of the uh, organised prostitution of children out of those uh, uh, children's homes in just one London borough to, that he was uh, well familiar with. It was dozens just there. Um, so if people want to go to commission.itnj.org, there's a number of excellent talks uh, of a calibre we rarely get. Uh, from ex-intelligence and ex-mainstream journalists um, and criminologist types uh, discussing this problem from many angles. And that, that was a, the result of a session I attended in th for three days in Westminster in April. So this is going places. We've got several formally constituted common law commissions in various jurisdictions now. The whole of the English-speaking world and continental Europe now got people coming together and it will be very difficult to knock this out because it's, it's a, it spans all the professions and the jurisdictions. Yeah, that, that's why that's certainly how I'm gauging it now. That so many people are talking about pertinent things, not little little sidebar things mm -hmm. that you can be deflected on. These are, you know, the banking system. It's perfect how they are stealing everything through that banking system. People still believe that they are borrowing money from banks. This is impossible. And when you try and tell people, you can see the ones that complete. Well, that's over my head. Well, do you know what, Alex? I didn't have a public school education. I'm an ex-taxi driver, ex-window cleaner. I've got seven GCSEs. I understand this like that. As if I, wonder, Paul, I wonder, Paul, whether you know that saying, it is difficult to persuade a chap of something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it, I understand the, the position that people are in and... I have to be honest, with, with all the banking stuff and the utility stuff that I got involved in, I don't think I would have gone and looked for it. I would have researched the information. But when they turn up and they don't just punch you in the face, they kick you in the balls as well, then I had to, I had to make a decision. I had to either, you know, stand up, say, listen, if you're going to bum me, you're going to pull my pants down and fight me because I'm not pulling my pants up when you finished. And that way, I had to make that decision. And... I don't think many people would make that decision until they're, they're on point, on, on the spot. Absolutely. So this is the problem. The, the, the famous names of UK column casework and equivalent news uh, sources that champion these horrendous cases, uh, these people are perhaps the 1% of the 1%. You could say that maybe one in 100 of the, of the country are now being victimised to this horrendous level, if not more. But of that 1%, perhaps only 1% have got that gutsy um, determination that you speak of, Paul, to say bloody-mindedly to the authorities, right, you're going to have a fight on your hands. Peter Hofstra, although he's a very quiet intellectual historian, turned out to be one of those. The Doherty's turned out to be one of those. Looking further afield as well, um, with the, the, the whole Scottish establishment coming down on the chap who made his uh, pug do a, a joke Nazi salute, yeah. um, he uh, turned out to have uh, more fight in him than had been reckoned. And so through uh, moments like that where the calculations misfire, you can see that usually these uh, groups uh, decide that they're going to go for certain targets and they have a checklist, whether it's mental or actually written out, that says, is this person vulnerable, not very well educated, doesn't look very presentable, etc., mm. dependent uh, on, on the state money or whatever. And if most of those are applied uh, applied to the case, then I think the victimizers think, right, we can go for this one. They, they're not going to squeal. But, you know, every once in a while, maybe one in a hundred, they do squeal. And then at least those who are watching the alternative media get to find out about it. And then to our astonishment and very pleasant surprise, Godfrey Bloom, the former UKIP man who was a member of the European Parliament this week, 
on Alex Jones of all places, uh, is invited on to talk about the Tommy Robinson affair, and he gives uh, a five-minute brilliant package describing the case of Melanie Shaw, the victim of the Nottinghamshire Children's Home System, where yeah. basically the um, that was the pool of children that were used uh, and abused, many of them in Westminster itself by members of Parliament and Cabinet Ministers in the 1980s. Melanie Shaw knows the names, but of course she's in solitary confinement now, and like Hofstra, she's been declared mad for the sake of mm -hmm. convenience. And Godfrey Broom, you know, that's the highest caliber man we've ever had to do this, uh, gave a whole package on exactly what had happened to her and why. It's amazing that um, people people aren't hearing that. If they aren't looking for this information, they aren't hearing it. But because it, like when I'm in work, they can't get away from me, Alex. <laughs> they have to listen to me. And every time somebody mentions a bill or anything like that, they all look at me. I'll go, well, all you had to start him off, didn't you? You had to get him going. That's all yeah. what I get. So it's become it's become a joke now. But I'll tell you what, I'm the first one they come looking for when they've got a parking ticket or something like that. But, you know, when it comes to things like mortgages and bills, you know, the factor is you should not, as a creditor, you should not be trying to pay this. You don't understand how it works. We don't even understand the correct mechanism yet. We're working on it, but we're getting there. And... 10 years ago, I was talking about the Bills of Exchange Act, Alex, and I felt like I was on my own. Nobody had heard of it. Nobody understood where a negotiable instrument was. I, I learn something new about it every day because it's that big a document and it means so much. You cannot operate in, you can't go into a shop without operating on the Bills of Exchange. It's, and it, it's, it's interesting to see now, even the ones who don't want to know about it are asking me questions. And it's good to see because uh, they say within 12 people, you could possibly know everybody in the world. I know more than 12 people, so I know that this information is getting out to people. And I know that the people are talking about it because they tell me. You know, that's what the interesting thing is. So you just mentioned Tommy Robinson there. I mean, I'm sure Andy's got his views and I've got my views. What is your view on this? I have um, to be very diplomatic what I say here. I'm cause... trying to be diplomatic as well. <laughs> My good colleague David Scott on Friday's UK Column News gave a very nuanced um, description of what's gone on. Uh, the issue we have is we've got maybe uh, among our followers and viewers three camps, and I think the whole of the truth movement at large would be the same. You've got fervent supporters of his, <clears throat> you've got sworn enemies of his, and you've got people who want to go back to first principles in the matter. And um, without wanting to be too superior, I'd like to say that I, together with David Scott and the rest of our crew, are in that one. You know, the, the fervent supporters, obviously, are the ones who see the massive problem uh, of ch child rape gangs and who think that Tommy Robinson is the cometh the man, cometh the hour. And then the fervent opponents are the ones who say that everything he does is directed from Tel Aviv. Um, and then we've got people in the middle. Camp, Alex. Yeah, I, 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 I do understand Alex. this because you know I'm speaking from the Netherlands, where Geert Wilders, you know, the, the the Dutch equivalent of Tommy Robinson in many ways, although he's the leader of the opposition over here. Um, he, according to sworn affidavits deposited by Dutch MPs several years ago, got drunk at a, a Christmas party one year and said, "I, I got entrapped by the uh, Mossad, and I'm a, a hostage for the whole of my political career. I can't sneeze without Tel Aviv telling me what to do." Wow. So, you know, he's eternally in opposition shouting about these Muslims uh, to stir the pot, it would seem. So I do have a full understanding of that, that position and of the people, including desperate Sikhs, for example, who have written to the UK Column and British Constitution Group this week saying, I'm very disappointed that you haven't come, all, come out all guns blazing for that English hero, Tommy, Tommy Robinson. I understand that, too, because the Sikhs have been targeted something horrendous. If you look at Berkshire, for example, 30 years of it. Um, but coming to the third position, really, uh, good old David Scott with the Scottish Enlightenment first in principles approach says, what is going on here? Well, uh, you've got a man who has not been uh, given a proper procedure. Um, uh, one of the very interesting aspects of this is that this is a case of criminal contempt of court, yeah? which is only one of the kinds of criminal of contempt of court. Criminal contempt of court, as its name suggests, because it carries a criminal sentence and has a crimin criminal penalty to it, is a criminal case. Where's the jury? There was, back in 1964, a US case. If you look at the Wikipedia item, uh, article for contempt of court, 
reports and uh, you go to the section on US, United States and then criticism, I think, you will find there that Justice Hugo Lafayette Black, a grand old Democrat Southerner, in the 1964 United States Supreme Court decision, wrote a correct, in my opinion, dissenting opinion from the bench, saying it is high time to extirpate root and branch the judge-invented, judge-maintained notion that a judge can try a criminal contempt case without a jury. You know? So uh, that is one factor. Uh, then again, you know, which judge? You know, no, no man can be a judge in his own cause. The same judge put him away as was trying the uh, case in which he had, uh, which he had uh, allegedly prejudiced by his presence there. Um, there's questions to answer about that. There's rumours, which I'm not going to repeat, about the judge's own affiliations and loyalties. But we do have, without you know, endorsing that, more and more such judges, uh, because it's now 20 years since the um, Blairite creation of a body called QC Appointments, which chooses barristers to be made Queen's Counsel, which is the only way to get up to being a judge. So it's an in-house arrangement now. Um, some of these judges are open Marxists and international revolutionaries. So many questions to answer procedurally. I think we have to separate the man from the issue and say, uh, if this man can be hauled off the street, then OK, it can happen to anyone. And that, that's the thing to blow the whistle about, really. And then the, the caveat to that is people say, oh, he was stirring the pot. He knew jolly well he was breaching an injunction. Well, I'm sorry, if you read the uh, what we know about the uh, remarks of... Uh, the judge, as he puts Tommy or Robinson away, he said, <clears throat> I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, it's not really much to do with the fact that there was an injunction against you. I'm offended by what you said in, it, in and of itself. Now, that should send shivers down anyone's spine. That should, because that means if that judge is offended by anything or anybody, he's going to be judge, jury and executioner. Um, yes. You, you had a guy, uh, a friend of mine on called Anthony Carlin over in Northern yes. Ireland, and he was obviously a serving police officer at the time. And he, um, as, I, as it, his words to me was, at that time, Paul, I, through my police investigative training, I realised I had enough evidence to make an arrest. And obviously the judge ran out into his chambers and phoned the police who came and arrested Anthony. And he said, he come back out and he says, I find you in contempt. He says, that's fine. He says, I'll have a jury trial. He says, no, I'll preside over it. So the guy who he was going to arrest gave him... 30 odd days in jail for contempt of court. That, that for a start, over a bank that is trying to claim a property that, you know, they, they talk about repossession. You cannot repossess something you've never possessed. And mm -hmm. you can't foreclose on an agreement when you've actually not got a dog in the fight. You haven't put anything on the table to borrow, to, to be, you know, lend out to anybody. So there is a judge who's not only willing to blatantly ignore what he's doing, but carry it on. So I expect you've been following Michael of Bernicia, and of course he's been making the great British mortgage swindle for a long time now. I believe there's some kind of general release coming up now, isn't there? I don't know. I've been waiting for this general release for about a year now, something like that. So have that. I, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've looked on um, Michael's work. I've been in touch with him, and um, I've spoke with Tom Crawford and Guy and all those, and for, for me... What they're doing is, it, it's something, every, wherever you're challenged in, in this uh, society is great, but it's not personally, it wouldn't be the attack that I'd be using because I've, I've worked on my stuff, so I know which, which side I would come at, whereas they're looking at a thing where they say, you know, there's a lot of people saying, well, he lost his court case, Tom Crawford, he lost it, and it was because this was rubbish and that was rubbish. He couldn't win that court case, Alex. He wasn't. He wouldn't be allowed to win. I wasn't allowed to win. I dragged it out for five years, and they gave up bringing the police in the end because I, I'd not sworn at anybody. I'd not shouted. So we were just going to court, and I remember him saying, "There's been far too much court time already spent on this case," and I dragged it out for five years, and that's all they were interested in because it was costing them money, not me, because I was representing myself. It was costing them money. And for a judge, as you just said, for a judge to be judge, jury and executioner, that is a dangerous precedent that we are now being um, mm. pushed into because I can't even say it's encroaching anymore. They're, they're basically pushing you in the back. I mean, I, I use an analogy, how policing and everything has changed in, in the last 30, 35, 40 years. When I was eight years old, I was on a Sunday morning, my mum had a news agent 
and I was up early because my mum was up early and none of my mates would be out of bed at, at that time I was out but I was playing cops and robbers on my own in the street and I just so happened to be playing cops and robbers with my 357 Magnum replica blank firer and I'm shooting this gun at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning this constable comes walking up to me he says uh, could I have a look at that young man I go yeah didn't think anything of it. I was in the 357 Magnum. He goes, oh, it's nice. That. Where do you live? I just live on in the shop on the front. Takes me around to the shop. My mum's just doing the papers and she looks up and she gives me this smile. And then you knew that she'd seen somebody behind me. And the smile changed and it went, what's he done? Straight away, <laughs> what's he done? And he <laughs> says, all right, Mrs. Webster, he's not done anything wrong, but I don't think it's a good idea that he should play with that on the streets and she he puts a 357 magnum on my mum's shopping counter <laughs> and she she went i didn't even know he took that out get in the back you and I'm going, <laughs> oh, I don't know you. but you fast forward that now 35 years an eight-year-old with a, um, a magnum replica and the policing that they are now that cop is not going to walk up to that eight-year-old armed response is going to be called chances are that kid could be dropped and yes, that yes. is the militarization of what the police and that has been um that has certainly encroached from the from the early 90s you could see where the policing was changing and you could hear all about the cuts and the amount of people good people who had joined the police to make a difference and every time i met obviously being a taxi driver i'd pick these people up regularly so oh, he's, he's still with the filth you went, no i'm not in that job anymore why you, you loved it he says, because I didn't join the job for 95% paperwork. He says, mm -hmm. I joined it to make a difference. And he says, all we're doing is revenue collecting. And we had a, a guy called Michael Feely on. He, him and his wife are both ex-coppers in the West Midland Police. And he, he, he could see all these changes coming through. And we, I always use an analogy that if America sneezes, about eight to ten years later, we're catching the cold. Yeah. And when you see what is going on in the policing in America... I saw, I read an article this week where a guy had got a cut to his hand from do, do, doing DIY and he'd gone to the hospital and obviously they, they got to pay over there. So they told him what, what they were going to do, blah, blah, blah. And he's gone, no, it doesn't matter, I'll leave it. They phoned the police, they got him in the car park, the police, and they've actually tasered him, cuffed him and took him back into the hospital because he refused treatment. So what is going on? What, how is that? A use of police you know the, the fact is that I ask a question in court and I'm, I'm, I'm police are called on me for asking a question so where is this policing going well it's as you just said there Paul it's revenue collection <clears throat> because if you're an adult of sound mind then there is no reason even for a nanny state to force you to undergo treatment unless of course it is in the interest of the blob which uh, the healthcare and the police both serve, that you should be charged through the nose because you, I'm sure you've seen uh, scans on social media of US hospital bills. Yes. And I didn't realize till our recent NHS conference that it was not always like that in the US, just like we're told lies about the pre-1948 British uh, health care provisions as well. Until the Nixon era, of course, the Watergate scandal broke what kind of man he was. Yeah. Um, it was, of course, a, a deliberate leak because he fell out of favor with the deep state. But, uh, you know, we know thanks to that what they're all up to. But it was in the Nixon uh, era uh, that uh, it was deliberately decided to crank up the model this way. Dr. Lucy Reynolds, who headlined our conference, will tell you more uh, about this, that um, the, the provision used to be much more, uh, the fee setting it used to be much more discretionary and the stitch up between a few large insurers came up much later. Yeah. And of course, insurance is a, a much wickeder industry then now than it used to be it used to be run from sound principles uh, less so on the continents where it's still got some better principles but uh, sharky us and city of london insurance conglomerates are taking over healthcare and uh, you know uh, monopolizing it and milking it for every penny there is and the beauty about the insurance companies they're all because a lot of the insurance companies extend credit only a bank can facilitate credit and therefore all these insurance companies again are underwritten by banks bringing the banks back into it. The, um, the thing is, there was um, uh, the European Parliamentary Directives 2006 talk about a third party liability. Now, this was the EU's version of operating the clean hands doctrine. They said to the banks that if you're going to rip your customers off like this, you need an insurance policy. 
They obviously don't tell you about this insurance policy, but the insurance policy is there and it's in the European directives. So people are having the houses taken. Now, if you default three times, that insurance policy is triggered automatically. It's paid off. So who? what are these banks doing saying that you still owe them money? Number one, 99.9% of them are being securitized and sold to reduce your liability. Then if there's a default, it's paid off in full. So if you say you've, you've gone to the bank thinking you're borrowing 100 grand, say they've securitized that and sold it for 90, you now owe to 10,000 pounds to yourself. But they don't tell you that because they've pocketed the 90. Then the insurance policy kicks in if you've defaulted. That's 100 grand paid off in full. Now they're coming for your house selling that for another 100 grand. So that's 290 grand they've made from one customer and you still owe them 450 pound plus VAT for facilitating your credit. This always comes back to the banks. And you, you made a, an interesting comment, I think I think it was last week where you were talking about Holland and not being a country. We know, we know that all countries are now corporations, but Holland is actually a corporation. Yes, because the royal family here, um, which strangely enough was a royal family even when the Netherlands was a republic, if you can work that out, because they were the presiding aristocratic family, the House of Orange, they're often thought of as stalwarts of conservative Protestantism, or well, they may have been in various points in their past, but they have been ahead even of our royal family. Uh, the Dutch and the Danish royal family have really been in the vanguard of corporatizing crowns. Uh, you know, the East India Company over here in the Netherlands was even more of a sharky model than the British East India Company was. Yeah. And of course, since the war, the Orange, the House of Orange has been in, uh, right at the vanguard of Bilderberg and all kinds of other initiatives. Uh, there's very much a move because the Dutch, like the Scots in many regards, they're slow to anger against their own governments. You know, they, uh, they're they very trusting and biddable in, in many ways because they want to get on with making money and caring about caring for their own families, which is a good uh, characteristic, but it gets used against them. The, the Dutch will go along with anything. They're told uh, there are no more checks uh, now and soon, you know, you won't have cash either. They'll say, oh, yeah, okay, okay. You know, they, they won't grumble much. We, we had um, a big upset a couple of days back where all the visa machines went down in the likes of Lidl and uh, Aldi and places like mm -hmm. this. And people were saying, we need cash, cash, cash. I need cash. You know, it was like a, an alien thing to him. Mm. We know where this goes, Alex, didn't it? That, they test something like that, and hey, they're not bothered about cash. We can now start taking the cash out of the supply. It's step by step. You know, we've been talking about this for so many years now. It's tiptoeing without you even noticing. You know, like musical statues. Every time you turn around, you, you think they're still in the same place. But it's those little things that they take away. You're never going to get them back. No. Uh, uh, there's a, a good friend of mine who's a bit of, uh, he's a big Jeremy Corbyn fan. Now, I'm not a politics fan. I, I understand politics, but I can't see how politics in this form that we've got can fix these problems. Mm -hmm. it's, got, it's, it's got to be completely different. But he's convinced that if Jeremy Corbyn gets in, then he's going to be the one who will fix everything. I went, please tell me you've got to be joking about this. You, you think there's a difference between a Labour Party and a Conservative Party when Thatcher, when she left office, was asked, what's your greatest achievement as a, as a Tory leader, PM? Mm -hmm. New Labour, that was her answer. So Tony Blair and New Labour is a creation of the Tories. That's, that's how she says it. Now, what that creation, what the Tories' creation was, is you've got to start looking into the backgrounds. When you get into these background, Alex, you, you see everything. You there's do. No there's no conspiracy theory. People, what people don't seem to have is time because we are forced into working these slave jobs to try and pay for something that you, it's impossible to do in a debt-based economy. And some people are now working, I know people who are working three jobs, whereas 10 years ago, they only needed the one, but they're, they're working like dogs and they're getting nothing out of it. Yet they don't understand they, and they haven't got time, you know, they, they go on, oh, I've, got, I've got two kids, maybe I've not got time to go and sit down and research all that. Mm. So, you, you know, they've got us, they've got us pretty much where they want us, but I think they, they must have moved something too soon or too quickly because the, the last five years, something's gone like that. Oh, it's yes. Like, it's like that, um, the, the 100 monkey syndrome, you know, it, it's like all of a sudden everyone's going, wow. Something's going on, you know. It's it, it's really it's 
it's good to see it was like i said it was so disheartening when i was talking to i go and give a talk and there might be three or four people there you know and I, when i was trying to run my own meetings to try and get people in my town interested in stuff like this it's difficult you know if it's not about football or something on the television then you're not the conversation starting to go and these aren't stupid people or you know they are intelligent people and they would understand it but there's always a cognitive dissonance there's always a reason there's always an excuse that they don't do it because of this they don't do it and it's it, it's always been how the hell do you set fire to these people and it's well it's a question of and feeling the pinch really isn't it it's very exactly. comfortable to live, so, to live in the cocoon i remember being you know a child of the 80s as well uh following the bbc talking with friends and relatives school and whatnot and family visits about the stuff on the bbc and, and the sports i was never so much into the sports but i remember the feeling of you know there being a community following these things none of them are real of course uh, and we nope. found out a lot more about the uh, the heroes so-called of all of these fields who turn out to be villains uh, mm. but you know it, it's, a, it's a nice cozy life to be yeah. continually in that kind of uh, jocular mode you know, you don't want to be uh, sh uh, shaken out of that reverie, do you? Well, it, me, me, Andy, Jason, and Ada, we've, we've said so many times, all four of us have been through our own hell, if you like. You know, mm. for whatever the different reasons. I mean, Andy will tell you he was homeless for, for a while. Mm. So we've all faced up to these tribulations, and it, it's one of those, what you've just said, what are you going to do about it? Are you just? I mean, I have people say to me, Alex, why didn't you just sell your house and start again? I says, but they have no authority to do this. Mm. Yeah, look, look at what it did to you. And I said, I'll tell you what, you've got a nice car. I'm going to come to your house tonight. I'm going to take your car. You buy another one, start again. And you, she went, that's not the same. I says, of course it's the same. These people don't own my property. They have no authority over my property or me, yet they've just blatantly told me that they've got authority to do what they like and again it, you can't set fire to those people because those people have got to be burned first before they even start looking where the smoke's coming from and i, I think all four of us uh, i'll speak for myself in any way but it was it was that I, i'm not the type of man i'm not the man that my mum wanted me to be and i'm certainly not the father that i should be if i was going to turn over and let that go i couldn't do it and it cost me everything and materially alex i lost everything but i've never been happier never been happier it, than it, now. it does take some men to take a lead you know paul and uh, you know especially in a country like england that's for starters um the women folk are going to say you know don't rock the boat i still yeah. have some of that from my dear wife i mean i told her just over dinner go to do a radio interview and she said will it lead oh. to death threats you know that's the kind of worry uh yeah. When I got started on this, my mother uh, was much of the same view of, you know, why are you putting your neck on the line? Let other people do that. But when she could see that I was actually committed to it and that I had to campaign in the ways I did, uh, then the attitude changed and she started supporting it, you know, a lot, lot, lot more. Cause she could see from the start, this goes back to the point you were just making, really. Uh, she could see that from the start that what we were saying about the extent of corruption was right. But the attitude is one of resignation. Just ignore what's, uh, just um, enjoy what you can of your life. No? Yeah. Um, this this really? changes over time as people yeah. lose out. I mean, there's not to be fair. There's um, quite a few family members of mine that wouldn't be aware of anything had it not been for me. And mm. as I said, a lot of them they can't get away from me when I'm there. They can't get away. But I it, I went through. Uh, you know how they always say when you when you're working through this stuff, you go through stages yourself. I mean, yes, you went do. through complete. You know, I was so flat. I was, you know, I'd, I'd given up, Alex. When you're sat in your empty house with your head in your hands, sobbing, not crying, mm -hmm. sobbing, you've done, for the first time in your life, you've actually sat down and you've studied. You've not only understood it, but as, as it is daylight now, I knew this stuff. I knew it. I don't know how or why I knew it. But yeah. as it, the more I read, the simpler it became and the, particularly with mortgages and stuff like that if you're complicating it it's not correct you've got to simplify it if it's simple it's correct and that's what you're working against when you're going into the legal world they complicate it on purpose they it's their game they understand yes. it play their game 
So I didn't go in with the I'm a man and I'm a free man and blah, 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 and all that. <laughs> Despite it being correct, it doesn't work in that jurisdiction. It's no, a waste, no. waste of time. But even when you play by their rules using their own legislation, I had um, that uh, Anthony Carlin uh, created case law. He had a high court order from a judge that stated, there was other bits to it, but it basically said, Santander, yes, you are a very big building society, but I can't take your word this man owes you money. You mm -hmm. must bring proof. So I put that in my case file. She picked the case law up, turned it over, and said, I can't see that. I take the bank's word that you owe them money. So that just shows, Alex, I can take you to court tomorrow and say, he owes me 20 grand, and the judge is going to go, you better pay him, Alex. I believe yeah. it. Yeah. Because yeah. that was the same premise. And it, again, it comes down to when you've seen that and you start looking into the history of the banks and the people who are surrounding it, and you see all these secret societies, all of a sudden it's not theory anymore. No. It's blatant in your face. And it's good that we've got people from all walks of life coming. I mean, you just mentioned um, one of the highest politicians that have ever brought any of the subjects up we talk about. And it's it's good that Cindy McKinney has been... I mean, I remember a grilly Donald Rumsfeld after the 9-11. I thought, whoa, I'm getting... You know, this stuff... You, 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 can't, you can't devalue even the smallest piece of information. A, a bit off subject from what we're talking about. Aspartame, for a yeah. start, was banned. That was discovered in 1974. It was banned until 1990. Why was it then put into everything? Well, Donald Rumfeld, CEO of Searle, who manufactured this uh, aspartame, gets in the White House, appoints his mate as the FDA director. All of a sudden, it's passed. Now, is that a conspiracy theory? No. They've obviously worked together and put that straight through. And, you know, everything. We can talk about water. I mean, uh, um, Ian Crane's doing some really good work with the. We had we had Ian actually on the show um, about the fracking and, and stuff like that. He's he's showing what has happened to the water table over in the states. There's some states where you can actually set fire to your water. I don't think that's really a good way to have a warm bath. And these people can't drink. They can't. What is going on? These are human rights. You've got an, um, a CEO of a company called Nestle saying that water is not a human right. And they're actually taking public water out of a reservoir, putting it in a bottle and selling it. And I, I, just, I don't get what, well, as you were saying about the Dutch, they seem to just follow suit. Oh, okay, we'll just go along with that. I think that is a lot of what has been the trouble, but the, the British eventually <laughs> get pissed off. They do in the end, end yes. And it, I think I think the stuff with like the likes of Tommy Robinson is people are pissed off, but they don't know why. They can't put the finger on it, so it's easy to point fingers at certain aspects of what is going on. Yes, the the massive problem with child grooming, rape gangs, but he's jumped on just one part of it. Yes, I understand how people are saying, "Well, you're only talking about Muslims." So, I mean, I've never. I, I wouldn't say I've, I've looked at a lot of Tommy Robinson stuff, but I've never seen him to be racist or heard him be racist. I've heard stuff that has been written about him, but I don't know him that well. And the fact I don't, is, uh, as David Scott said on Friday, I don't think there's any evidence that Tommy Robinson is racist, but then yeah. Mike Robinson is quick to add, and he's equally correct, that Tommy Robinson has a strategy of only talking about Muslim uh, exactly. gangs. That's you know, that, that is the problem. And Brian Gerrish's ad, uh, angle, which he ad valuably adds from years of covering this is that the abusive stuff spinning out especially from the major cities from the 1960s if not 50s onwards that has been there in the police cover-up of it and yeah. the the muslims who are currently in the public eye for this are the johnny come lately they're the latest of a series of criminal fraternities uh the muslims involved i should say are the latest in a series of criminal fraternities who get the spoils to be the muscle you know but yeah. the the controlling minds have always been white Yes. Well, that's been the same throughout, hasn't it? I mean, when, when again, it, it, it comes always seems to come back to the one thing which is banking. That banking controls yes. everything. Give me control of a nation's money supply. 
I don't care who makes its laws. Oh, absolutely. Somebody once said that. <laughs> yeah, it does. You just reminded me of something, Paul. I don't know if there's uh, time before the top of the hour to read it out. It's a very short poem by Rudyard Kipling that you made me think of uh, because it was, um, you were just saying that the British are very slow to anger. Yes. And uh, Kipling realised this, and he says in a poem called The Beginnings, it was not part of their blood. It came to them very late with long arrears to make good when the English began to hate. They were not easily moved. They were icy willing to wait till every count should be proved ere the English began to hate. Count meaning charge or suspicion. Yeah. Their voices were even and low. Their eyes were level and straight. There was neither sign nor show when the English began to hate. It was not preached to the crowd. It was not taught by the state. No man spoke it aloud when the English began to hate. It was not suddenly bred, it will not swiftly abate through the chill years ahead when time shall count from the date that the English began to hate. Brilliant. Beautiful. That's quite succinct, that. It is, isn't it? That's the, 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 uh, the, the um, wrongdoers are very afraid of the British people, actually, because they know that historically they have been very slow to anger, but then they follow through on their anger. That that's that again touches on to why I can't put my finger on it, but they've they've moved something, they've done something too soon, and there's more people clicked. Maybe it's um, the, what's been happening in Northern Ireland, where you know people are being turfed out of the houses on two days before Christmas, yeah. and these back to stealing property. And again, as long as it's not affecting people, then they won't do anything. Mm -hmm. but I think there's a time coming. I mean. It, again relating to that poem if you i always look back to um romania when ceausescu was deposed nobody saw that coming no no it wasn't it wasn't advertised nobody there's no rumblings and then all of a sudden he's swinging from a lamppost next to his wife no romanian would have said i felt that coming but collectively as a collective organism the romanian yeah. people knew when the, the moment was right and we as a collective as of the british people we all know when the moment is right to take that, lawful action yeah that's what's beautiful well, there's so many people coming from all different angles and that's how it has to be there's no one man or one woman got the answer to this no it's got to be a collective of people we're not germans we can't be led by a fuhrer <laughs> no well she's trying her best <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, I th andy are you, are you ready to, for our time though or? yeah we've got some music lined up mate if you're ready for it yeah we can have a break and then i'd like to get just touching on the Tommy Robinson thing again, I want to know if there's uh, if you, if you feel there's any distraction element to that as well as what what we were talking about, mainly looking along the lines of Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. not say. Um, I'd like to just uh, a brief apology to everybody who was trying to listen on Spreaker. Uh, I don't know whether the sound quality is a bit better there, but it wasn't running. Um, that was an issue with the software. There was a bit of a glitch and it switched itself off just as we started. So I'll have to keep an eye on that in future when we're doing the dual broadcast. But uh, we've got seven and a half minutes of music. We'll be back after that. Hi, I'm Andrew K. Fletcher, originator of Incline Bed Therapy, talking to you on Rock and Turn News. Three. Right, I've got to turn that down, haven't I? That's it, we're clear, but we're still on Facebook. Got a few listening, mate. Are you muted, Paul? Yeah, I've not seen, I'm just, um, <laughs> I, I was looking for the questions. Oh, I, I, there wasn't really a lot of questions. Uh, there was a bit of a funny comment that um, Dave Gagan shared. He's, what was it? I can't remember what it was he put. It was funny, though. Uh, let's have a look. I'll show you. He shared it in a group, and he put... Live now, secret society chit-chat. <laughs> <laughs> That's one, Dave. I've just seen Lisa tell us. Lisa Tanner posted, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. All the house of cards, yeah. I agree with you, Lisa. Bloody right. Yeah, that brilliant, mate. 
that's your first hour solo. You, no problems there. <laughs> yeah, you was a little bit. Uh, you was a little bit. Uh, uh, what do I do now at the start? But you soon got in the flow of it. So yeah, brilliant. I was talking to myself. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've got a bit of what we got playing now. We've got uh, CJ Ramon, Three Angels, followed by James J. Turner, Come With Me. So we've got, I got a clue about any of them. <laughs> five and a half minutes, mate. So I'm just going to have a quick slash. Yeah, I'm on. <laughs> Oh, Dave's just commented, you're doing a great job, Paul. Oh, Paul's gone, sorry. <laughs> So what's life like over in Holland then? Very comfortable, it's... really. People yeah. are quite cheerful. Well, it, I, I had a conversation with a guy we used to have on regularly, used to talk about money, and, and he was saying that a lot of um, English people get the, the misconception that everything is so liberal and laid back in Holland. Oh, it isn't. Where <laughs> it really isn't the case. No, it isn't, no. Yeah, his, his girlfriend was leaving to come to the UK to live with him, and she, they they wanted forwarding addresses and and like references and stuff like that before she left the country. And he's like, "What?" I know it's ridiculous. Mm. They're, they're quite uh, retentive. No, it's a good place to be if you know how they work. Yeah. Which oh, is, and Andrew's just warning thing. us that Facebook's still mm. live. Dave Gagan says you're doing a great job, Paul. And nice one. Cheers. Jean Melnick says, I'm listening here, Paul. Is that a friend of yours? Yeah, oh, she's lovely, Jean. Oh, awesome. Hi, Jean. Right, what have we got left? Have you got a place where I can see the chat coming in? Um, you... Raconcernsnews.com. Okay. There's not many in the chat room there. If if you go on Paul's Facebook, you'll be able to see it there. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. The, we're getting more chat on Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. The beauty of doing it on both is we get more live listeners with Facebook Live, but when... Uh, when we finish broadcasting, it's uploaded to YouTube, it stays there and it just keeps clocking the hits up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, good. Da -da. We've got a good few shares as well tonight. Mm -hmm. Oh, Gene says, Hi, Paul, wake them all up. <laughs> Doing my best, Gene. Doing my best.
How long's left there, Paul? Right. We're near 48 seconds. So uh, the last 10 seconds, I'll put the music up so you can hear it fade. And then as soon as I click to make the buttons live, I'll just give you a thumbs up. Yeah. 30 seconds. Welcome back to Raconteurs News, uh, the second half of the show. I uh, appear to be a raconteur alone this evening. Uh, Andy's producing behind the scenes, but whilst um, Jason and Ada are both convalescing at home, uh, hope you get well soon, guys, and you get back on the show. Um, I'm with my guest, um, Alex Thompson, from many, many other things, but at the moment he's working a lot for the UK column. Um, we had a great chat. Uh, for the first half of the show. So let's not waste any more time and let's get back into it, Alex. So we mentioned just before uh, about the Tommy Robinson um, <laughs> episode. And um, do you feel that apart from stirring up what we were talking about, those intentions, do you see that this is playing a dual role? Is it deflecting from what's going on in politics at the moment, in your uh, opinion? That's definitely its effect, Paul. Whether it was intended that way or planned that way, I'm not so sure because, well, it could be, but if you're putting a risk reporting restriction on the case, and even to this day the mainstream media are not reporting it as though the restrictions were still fully in place, David Scott's trying to get to the bottom of whether they are with the court in hull, which isn't proving easy because they're replying to him saying, first tell us who you are and why you need to know. <laughs> but even if we say that the reporting restrictions are no longer in place, the, the point is they were put in there in the first place. So yeah. uh, the wall of silence seems to have been the, what the establishment wanted. Uh, yeah. But that, they're not dumb. They know that there's millions of people on alternative media, though, and that they would go around the world like wildfire. I don't think they were counting on major U.S. outlets like the National Review and Fox News championing Tommy Robinson. Yeah. So, uh, of course, these people have got the, the platforms that will reach the British middle class immediately again, which is uh, perhaps unforeseen. But, yeah, the effect has been that people are up in arms about this co celebre. The, the experience we have is that people tend to be on a particular case or outrage for about a month before it dissipates. So that is a good blocking window for other things. So it's perhaps more accurate to say that with this uh, distraction or smokescreen in place, and it's certainly not a distraction for, for Paul Tommy Robinson, although I do have to share your, your um, very real concerns about who he is by, by in terms of background, uh, he is now you know, in a very dangerous situation. Um, with, with the, without any kind of callousness about it, I'll say that with that smoke screen, that distraction in place, uh, there's all kinds of other things that could be slipped through. Uh, yes. Common Purpose have a track record, record of this going back at least two decades. You may recall that um, after 9-11 there was the hoo-ha about the Labour Party advisor woman, Joe, someone, who sent uh, the email, uh, yeah. renowned email, today is a great day for burying bad news exactly. and ask people what to do. Now, Brian Gerrish found out later that she was not just any old common purpose woman, she was senior enough that she was embedded in the Bishop of Exeter's office uh, yeah. for certain purposes, uh, who was the major champion in the episcopate of um, common purpose. And he found this out because when the under Prescott, when the government office for the South West in this regional model that they were following, decided to have... Um, a debate on whether they should have these uh, regional assemblies, which they went ahead and did anyway. The Bishop of Exeter hosted it in his cathedral, the debate on this, and Brian Gerrish was wanting a, a say in it. And so he got in touch with the Bishop of Exeter's office, and it was this very same woman who wouldn't give her name and just called herself a senior with the Labour Party. So that's just a way of saying uh, Common Purpose have a habit of, uh, of burying bad news, and they're, uh, they're aficionados throughout the public sector. So there is no shortage of bad news on Brexit to be buried. So we put it that way. There's, um, I'm not along the doom-laden lines of some, but there are some high-caliber people um, with a, you know, a strong focus on economics or customs or import and export issues who are basically uh, talking about the country starving and yeah. uh, planes being grounded. And I'm beginning to think that's maybe not quite as far-fetched as it, it might seem. But yeah. you know, with a bit more skepticism than that, you can still say there's all kinds of roadblocks ahead. 
uh, if we're to persuade us to turn back and get on the EU bandwagon in some capacity or other. Yeah, I mean, I, Brian always brought up a good point about the uh, the uh, armed forces being integrated. I mean, obviously, being in in the navy for that length of time, he's seen everything. I mean, I was I, I didn't think it could get any more ridiculous. To then he 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 brought up the um, the Satanism that is a recognised religion in the navy, and I'm going. What is going? What is, this world has gone absolutely bonkers in the last twenty years, and I, I, I shudder to use the term "wake up." But when all this started to happen to me, I've always been a conspiracy theorist. My dad got me into the JFK assassination when I was about seven, and it, you know, the, I think it was the Warren Commission's uh, investigation into the Warren Commission's finding. It was the seventies investigation. And this bullet stopped, turn right, stopped, turn left. And me and my dad shot rifles at that time. And I said, Dad, how do they get bullets to do that? He said, they can't. <laughs> he said, they can't. And he never said anything else, Alex. He just left it with me. But that yeah. grew into all the conspiracies that I could not could get my hands on. Obviously, the internet has brought everything to fruition. But you can't, if you look at all this stuff separately, yes, you could possibly get a bit of cognitive dissonance and agree on the you know official version but when you start looking at it and analyzing it and then showing how the people are all connected through various different ways it always it, it shocks me now that people can't see it it really does i, I can't understand how people can't see how apparent it is because it's not even like they're being secretive about this anymore they're blatantly just saying we're going to do this you know, well, it's like, a massive paradigm shift for people to swallow yeah. because, you know, they've been brought up correctly to believe that the British are a good people and mm -hmm. to be proud of the British role in the world. And, you know, the whole schooling on top of that is, um, you know, be a good little boy or a good little girl and you'll get a good little position in society. Exactly. It's quite a bitter pill to swallow to, to be told, you know, actually there's, uh, there's Satanists and other kinds of turds at the top of everything. Mm -hmm. And millions of people do not want to hear that. No. Yeah. No, they really don't. And the fact is, when you do bring it up, there's always a reason. Oh, that's just mm -hmm. that's just this, that's just that. I mean, I think, wasn't there a wedding? I think there was a wedding a month or so back. I forget who got married. But right. you, you had people, you had people who were camping out um, so they could get a good spot. And he's dressed with his Union Jack hat on. And, and he's saying, oh, the people of Windsor are lovely. They, they brought us food. They brought us drink. What about the homeless people that the police shuffled off two days earlier who were living in exactly the same spot? Where were the people of Windsor then? You know, the, the, feeding, the feeding flag wavers. What, you know, people want to ask themselves, what contribution to society is a flag waver? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're championing your own enslavement. I just, I don't get it. You know, no. it's something I've never mm -hmm. got. I can only attribute it because... I, I'm a I'm a big football fan, so I can attribute the uh, the tribal stuff as as in with my team. Uh, so I do get it. But the, you know, football is a game, and uh, you know, for anybody who's, who loves football, a lot of the times they'll say it's more than a game. No, it's not. It's not. It's a game with the stuff that is going on right now. Real things happening to real people, and you've got a punt paid two hundred and fifty grand a week who chips over his shoelace. And it goes rolling about. It's not my game anymore. I used to play that game, and it was a contact sport. Not not like it is now. But these people, as you touched on in the first half, these people are held up as idols. Mm. And what is the difference between a, a football and two hundred and fifty grand a week to a gladiator? You know, it, it, it's the same things, bread and circuses. Give them that. It's what the Romans realised in the, the late corrupt period of the Roman Empire that the crowds needed. If they've got increasingly awful lives in increasingly austere cities mm -hmm. uh, with great violence and devaluation of the currency and sexual depravity and all the things that we know now, they were all happening in the 2nd, 3rd century AD in Rome. And the only way to keep people sweet was to give them handouts and sports. Yeah. You know, of a particular kind that you just described. So it's a, it's a well-known model. All the commercial ruses and all the ways of controlling people have been known to the bloodlines for a long time. And they, they peak at certain periods, late Roman Empire being one. Yeah. Well, if you take it right back to Sodom and Gomorrah, exactly what you've just said there is exactly mm -hmm. what happened. So we never learned 
anything. And the people who actually know history are the ones who are actually in control of it right now. Yes, so, which is why it, bogus history or badly taught history is favoured in schools. Exactly. But it's one of the reasons why people won't rise up, of course, Paul, because, um, you know, if you were designing a curriculum for English history, uh, the likes of you or I would want to put things in like the William Penn trial, where the jury said, you know, we're going to be locked up by this judge in preference to pass um, a judgment which we know to be wrong uh, because the judge tells us to. You know, that the directing the jury is something that, that no Englishman would accept in those days. Well, I'd be, I'd be wanting in the school curriculum for business economics, the Bills of Exchange Act. I'd be wanting the kids to, listen, you can't pay these bills. You're not going to get rid of the debt. We've got to forgive the debt and start again as creditors. It's the only way forward. But this is how you remedy your bills. They will send you the remedy. Mm. Let's, that's what I'd be teaching the children because they're operating. They're being taught to operate in a system and the, they're making it worse. But they, it doesn't matter how hard they work. They're making it worse. And they don't know the alternative to making it better. Right? It, I always say to people, look, if you're struggling to pay your mortgage, would you not let yourself off? Would you forgive yourself if you couldn't pay yourself back? Well, yeah, of course I would. Well, that is what's happening. You've lent the money to yourself. They facilitated it. That's it. So... What is stopping you? Well, I've signed a mortgage contract. No, you've not signed a contract. You've signed an agreement. So people could challenge. They, could, they don't have to stop paying bills to challenge. No. You know, it, it, it's, it's about getting that first stage. I mean, I've had people contact me, people local to me, friends of mine. Hey, Webby, I've, I've done it. I'm not watching TV again. I've got rid of my TV license. Brilliant. It's, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a start. You're challenging because you're thinking. The best thing I ever did was to turn the TV off, Alex. Oh, yeah. It's the best thing I ever did because it was so numbing, but I understand coming home from a 12-hour shift and no, just numbing yourself into existence, cracking a couple of cans of lager open and just, oh, just take everything away. I understand that. I've been there. And it's not a nice place to be when you, your life is that and then you get up and do the exact same thing again. I want better for my daughter. Yes, my daughter's twenty four next uh, next week on Monday, and my daughter lives in a cucumber castle on top of a cherry oak tree with unicorns on it. She's done. She's not going to get the bills of exchange. She's not. It's too scary for her. She's mm -hmm. a photographer. She's artistic. That's what she's good at, and she brings an innocence to this world because she's she is naive. But it's because of the schooling system. That kid put her hand up. When she first started high school, she put her hand up because she didn't understand the maths question. And I, for, for somebody who didn't do well in maths, I can add up, take away all that stuff, but maths was very boring to me. Um, as long as I could do that, my mum said, I'm happy with that. But English, I've always found it easy. She doesn't find things like that easy. But artistic, she can cope with. But she put her hand up and she said, could you explain that question to me again? And because he, he'd taken time to explain it to the class, he ridiculed my daughter for a minute in front of everybody. That kid never put her hand up again, Alex. Which, you know, is, of course, is teaching her the lesson, I'm sorry, sad to say, uh, of what you're there to do. Exactly. Which is to conform. If people don't know the books of John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O, they should definitely read them. And Charlotte Thompson Isabit, I-S-E-R-B-Y-T. Gatto, you'll find a lot of his talks on YouTube. Sadly, he had a stroke after a mammoth a whole weekend long lecture that he gave to some people but i think he's still alive and isabit has a site called the deliberate dumbing down of america yeah. ddoa where uh, she has a i think her whole book is a pdf and all her source materials are still there on the website so, and yeah, this is talking about experiments led by the tax exempt corporations sorry tax exempt foundations which were yeah. funded after the second world war by the corporations um in order to uh, produce certain kinds of people. So they did experiments in uh, finding out what the values of people were at home and finding out who the dangerous parents were who taught their children anything and uh, basically undoing it at school. That is that is quite sad that, that they actually had children informing on their own parents. It's Stasi. We, we say off more and more often, Paul, that we're going to the Stasi system because that was run on what the Germans called inoffizielle Mitarbeiter, unofficial collaborators. Wow. You know, one in four of the population or whatever it was would rat on uh, on the, their classmates and their, their parents and whatever. And we see the police bringing this back almost by the day now, Sajid. Yeah. We're talking about it now. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it comes down to, I mean, if you look at your birth certificate, they've already started it there because the debt slave that you're going to become when you're registered at birth next to where my dad's name was, was informant. Yes. So I'd been informed on. And then I get a, and people, I tell, tell people at work, when, well, you volunteer your income tax. No, I don't. They just take it. But you've already volunteered it. You got a, you got an employee number, your national mm. insurance number. As soon as you use that, well, I can't get a job with, without using it. It's a great scam, mm. isn't it? So they mm-hmm. can take money off you through your consent because you've got to use a number that they gave you. Oh, and that's ace. There was great controversy in the 1960s when, the, I think in the United States, the social security number was introduced uh, because they saw what it would lead to. And of course, before that, controversy in every English-speaking country over the introduction of income tax. It was always presented as a temporary measure. And look at what they did from, from the 60s onwards. They've put as many people as they possibly can on benefits. Yes. So they, so they just get... And but in, you, in your part of the country, you see the effect because it's reached a scale there as it was intended to because, you know, the, the city of London regards a uh, large tract of the country, including most of Lancashire, as, you know, experimental or, or for plebs to, to live in. And uh, you can see the hopelessness that's engineered. It goes back a long way further than that. It goes to the Industrial Revolution, you know, that uh, Manchester especially was regarded as um, a testbed for, the, for a deliberately cynical, deliberately anti-human model of Industrial Revolution. The Germans and the Americans got did a much better job of industrializing admittedly a bit later than we did but you can see that the same evil minds behind our industrialization uh, industrialization and of course you get the deliberate rise of marxism and uh, all the vices that follow that well th- that was interesting that you bring up for uh, marxism because I, I remember seeing a lecture by sergey besmanov oh yes yuri, yuri besmanov yes yuri he also Bez- used the german uh, alias thomas schumann didn't he with that's him yes yes, yes. and how he said when he defected and he came to the US, he went to the US in the 70s, he couldn't believe that 80 to 85% of cultural Marxism, what he worked on, was actually already the, the pornography, the, dis, the, the destruction yeah. of the family. And you look at the state of society now, look at where we're all at. It's, it's an absolute mess. And, you know, we're talking about if there's more than two genders now, Alex. Now, if, if you have a penis, you're a bloke. If you have a, don't have a penis and you've got a vagina, I think you might be a woman. Yeah. Anything else in between, my personal opinion, I think there could be some mental health issues that should be explored. But well, it's, it is mental that's the problem here, because yes. as always with Satanist agendas, we're not valued by Satanists for our minds, because they regard their Lord Satan as having a far superior mind to anyone on earth, or all of us put together. The whole idea of transhumanism and uh, the psychological tricks, MK Ultra, Tavistock, all the things that people will no doubt have researched to listen to you, the point of them is to keep our bodies so that we can slave and, uh, and function for uh, others to use, but uh, suck us dry of our minds because there's no use for that. No, not at all. I mean, uh, Rockefeller was quoted as saying, I don't want a nation of thinkers, I want a nation of workers. Well, they're explicitly so. In the post-war period, the... Um, junior minister, I forget her name, for education in the Rab Butler government, celebrated, of course, for its educational progressivism by some, was saying, and so were some of the tax-exempt foundation people in the US at the same time, uh, when they were creating the secondary moderns, which have plagued the likes of Lancashire, you know, because of the uh, the way that they've deliberately diseducated uh, bright kids, um, or talented kids with with non-academic bent, shall I say, Um, they were saying in the, the 40s, uh, in concert on both sides of the Atlantic, we want uh, a, a generation that's stupider than its parents because that's the requirement of the new kinds of industry. And on the continent at the same time, the same um, synchronicity involved because I found sources saying that both the Belgian and the Dutch agriculture ministers in the same period were saying, we can't have individual farmers anymore. We have to make them into agribusinesses. And anyone who can't keep up with it, the small uh, farmer who inherited his plot is going to have to emigrate. We don't want him here. So there was a lot more honesty in those days. Yeah, that's a, that's another sad thing that, that the fact that we don't we're not even self sufficient as in being able to grow food for our country because our farmers are being subsidised, they're being paid not to grow. It's yeah. and you, this, again, this, is, this comes from a particular wing. This uh, beggaring Britain comes from a particular wing of conspiracy, which is global revolutionary, which has always been embedded in Germany. We have our own um, wicked and and, uh, um, uh, conspiratorial people, but one of the uh, other strands has always come out of Germany, and that's the origin of Trotskyism and Leninism. 
And they have always regarded Britain and America as the main enemy. For that, you should read the books of Christopher Story, S-T-O-R-Y, Story, particularly yeah. a PDF of his you'll find called the EU, the European Union Collective Enemy of its Member States. And in that and his other books, uh, and it's thought he may have been bumped off for these books, uh, certainly his heart attack has some questions about it. Uh, Story was saying in his latter years, um, these uh, basically German bloodlines wanted Britain beggared. Uh, but that, that, that's not the whole of the conspiracy because there's also been Anglo-American aspects of it who've uh, thought that Britain should be the centre of the world. Yeah, well, financially it's not too far off, I suppose, at the moment. But <laughs> um, I think when when you start looking into it and, you, you again, you're coming back to all these business models and things like that, you mentioned Lancashire. Obviously, I'm, I'm from Lancashire. I live in a, t a town called Lee. Now, that... That town was rich, self-sufficient. Yes. It was a mill town. It was. It, uh, I look at the back at the old photographs of Lee now. That um, it was a beautiful town, self-sufficient. And then we gave up sovereignty of our own council and gave it to a local borough. We gave it yes. to another town. Now there's a lot of rivalry, a lot of animosity between Lee and Wigan uh, yeah. due, due to the miners' strikes and stuff like that. And that town from being salt of the earth hard-working people has completely changed the people have changed the accents has changed yes and we have nothing in this town we have charity shops that are closing down alex mm. you know that when pound shops and charity shops are closing down you know your town is on its ass I've noticed the same in Warrington, actually, the whole belt around Greater Manchester has gone yeah. that way. Uh, my grandfather was from Cheshire, and uh, I remember at one point we went into a second-hand bookshop and found a book remaindered from the local working men's club, and it was a Greek lexicon for people wanting to study New Testament Greek, remaindered from the library of the working men's club, and the whole of the north of England used to be like that, of course. But yeah. what, what could be done in conspiratorial terms, or, or oligarchic terms, what could be done with such self-sufficient, well-educated, healthy people? Exactly. It, it's, it doesn't bode well for them, does it, if you've got an informed people? But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to raise awareness. There are people who I've, I bump into. Um, I've got I've got my Raconteurs News shirt on, and I've got my Facebook page on the back, which is called Lower the Cost of All Your Bills to Zero. Mm -hmm. And it's basically start learning the bills of exchange. Go and find out what, what I'm talking about. People t and say, what, what does that mean on your shirt? What do you mean, lower the cost of all your bills? So it strikes up a conversation. And I wasn't having that conversation. You know, back in 1980, when I was at junior school, I clearly remember sitting down in a history lesson. And in those days, you'll remember, Alex, where you'd, you'd write the date in the top right-hand corner. You'd yes. Write the title, and then it's pens down, we're going to discuss the subject. And yes. I wrote the date, and I wrote Bills of Exchange Act, 1882. And I put my pen down, I fold my arms, I went, I'm never going to use this. This is useless. <laughs> it's everything. It's everything. And you know what? That was off the back of one history teacher who decided to bring that into the curriculum. It wasn't part of the curriculum. I've never known anybody get taught it, particularly at a school like me, where I went, an ordinary high school. You know, I believe people who go to Eton and that, they're taught the Bills of Exchange at very early on. Oh, yes, if you want to exploit people, you need to know this stuff, of course. Of yes. course, of course, but it's very easy to exploit people when the people you're exploiting haven't got a clue. Correct, yeah. and schooling is a major part of it because, of course, you don't have the discretion now as a, as a good teacher to put things in the curriculum because every single lesson has to be planned and curricularised. No, my, uh, my best friend is a, a teacher and she, she's a primary school teacher and she is, the, the, as the curriculum's changing, she can't believe it. She can't believe that some of the stuff that they're trying to introduce into, you know, you're testing four or five-year-olds on SARS. They don't even know what they want for the dinner. No. What are doing to children? And they want them earlier and earlier. As you just well, what you what they're doing, Paul, is teaching them mindless, uh, mind-numbing, repetitive obedience. And that is being given the name resilience in the US version of this called Common Core. Sure. And I think you see it sometimes in Scotland's version called the Curriculum for Excellence. They use the name, the word resilience, which is also used by the securocrats in terms of resilience uh, after a terrorist strike. Wherever you see it, it's a code word for switch mind off and do as told. Yeah, that's exactly it. I saw a great meme actually the other week where it showed um, a load of young 
people like that doing selfies so never before in history has it been documented that so many young people documenting doing so little yes. you know it, it, we, the younger people these days because I'm, I'm not i sound i sound my age when i say kids but like 19 you know 16 to 25 year olds the majority of them speak in sound bites you can't have a conversation and that is people both in my job and people of the public you're having these in i don't wish to sound harsh but they're inane conversations yeah, i walk yeah. around the supermarket and I, there's no conversation there's some there's stuff about, about what film they watch what football's on or it's just intonation, isn't it? There's not really yeah. any words to it. Grunt, 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 grunt. Exactly. And these people then go home and cook tea and they sit there and they watch that shit. And I did that. But I can't do it now because no. I've looked around and I've gone, we're in a shit heap here. We need yeah. to do something about this. Yeah. And I, as we were talking about those phases that we, I went through, I went through a real angry phase where I wanted to shout at everybody because... You've been, you have been. You don't have to pay for your gas. You can't pay for it. What do you mean you're just going to carry on paying it? Oh, I'll, I don't know. I'll, I'll just keep doing it. But you're making the problem worse. Mm. Well, who's going to pay your bills? I'm like, you can't pay your bills. <laughs> and you think, I, was, I wanted to throttle some people. But, you know, as soon as I dropped that and I calmed down and I didn't let it bother me anymore, that's when my life got better. Yes. When, when you're in the... When you're in the shit heap and you're being kicked in the balls and punched in the face and you're face down in the dirt and your your friends and your family pick you up and you're not dead, then mm. you can then get on. But I went angry, angry, angry because what can you do against a faceless firm? I mean, I was up. I've been up against barristers and all kinds, and these people couldn't ask, answer me questions because if they answered me questions, they'd either have to lie. Or they give the game up. Yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, when when it comes down to it, you've got you can only be yourself. And have you got what it takes to do something about this? Not a lot of people have because they they do that, stay under the radar. I did it, and then then it came and kicked me in the balls, and I, you just couldn't hide away from it. I ask people now, though, what are you going to do after I've told you all this? Say you lose your job tomorrow and you default on your mortgage, are you just going to give everything up? Some said, yeah, but others, others who, uh, you know, I can put a six foot four bloke who's going to smash a woman's face in and she wouldn't back down, but put a corporation or a bank or a council to go. This is the psychological operation involved, isn't it? You know, yes. this is what we have to break. And in, <clears throat> in all of these areas, the monetary system, the uh, legal system, child abuse and rectifying it, we're, we're having to uh, really leave uh, right off as, as, a, as a bad lot the existing institutions. Uh, they're not going to reform. Our schools are not going to reform. Then They weren't created for us. Our banks weren't created for us. Our courts in, in the current incarnation, although they come out of our common law, are not uh, there for us. Our parliament's not going to be reformed as far as I can see. We're going to have to do things for ourselves. We're going to have to police ourselves. And as, you know, uh, as my father was quick to point out to a policeman in, in the early 70s um, when he was ticked off for taking the law into your own hands, Mr. Thompson. He said, we put the law in your hands and if you don't enforce it, we will take it back. You know, that, that is uh, the job of, uh, so of the police is, is to do the, the, the job full time that all of us have to do as uh, yeah. you know, citizens enforcing the law. So now we're, we're at the point where all the commissions and uh, initiatives and foundations that I help through my UK Colm involvement, uh, with it, when I transcribe the keynote speeches, they all come to the same points. Uh, we're going to do this for ourselves now. Yeah, that, that's where it has to come. I was at the Chartist meeting in Manchester uh, yes. a couple of months back, and I really I expected maybe half a dozen people. There wasn't loads of people. In fact, a, a, a talk in the next room on Marxism had more people in it than <laughs> the Chartist did. But I was still amazed at the amount of people that had turned up because, again, people know there's something wrong. They don't know what it is and they don't know what to do about it. Now they're finding out what it is, they also now want to know what they can do about it because, you know, people have asked me things like, also, oh, you don't pay for any of your bills. Mm. But 
once I've got the well, you can't pay them out the way. No, I couldn't just destroy my entire life just so I can prove a point. I said I've had to pick and choose. You know, five, six years in, in court going all, to uh, high court, to Queen's Bench, all this stuff, and then putting other stuff on top, it would have been too much, Alex. But yes. yes, I can tell you the truth, but you'll have to go and research it for yourself. Um, a, a friend of mine used to uh, constantly help people and he'd do, he'd put all his own documents together and he'd type for them and he'd do reams and reams of, of paperwork for these people. And they, he'd get no thanks for it. He no. didn't want to pay him, but he didn't, you know. I said, you're going to do all this work and you know people will let you down. People will let you down. You've got to do this. What I see as well, I get pinged by you know, some very good people who really need my help, where I am perhaps the only person they know of that could help. But I get a lot of others. Just pinging me saying, do this for me. Tell me what books to read. You know, exactly. uh, tell me whether X, Y, Z is is true. You know, uh, have you got the internet? Find out for yourself. But that was what it's got to come down to. Nobody, could, nobody did it for me, Alex. I had to do it myself because I had no choice. And that's what it's got to come down to. People have got to think: Is this what they want for their children, for their grandchildren? Do they want the to? Because they're being told the truth. Do you still want to willingly hand over your children? To what is coming because what is coming it, you're going to make it, it's a decision for good this yeah you know th there's, a, there's a lot more you know we can talk about um, what people are doing with the judicial system with the banking system but there's bigger principalities at play here no, you know no. the, the it's it's going to come down to the basically the good versus evil there's, good people, yeah. there's evil people but if the good people don't do anything that's all they need to do is nothing. And, and there's a lot of people in the middle who are just led. They go yes. with the crowd and the evil have got them uh, being led by the nose at the moment. But okay. there is still a chance for the good people to, to start leading them instead. But we have to, to um, actually act like leaders. And, yeah, you know, well, we've been very democratic for the first decade or two of this, this movement. And because we're British and because we're not, you know, we don't want to lord it over people. Uh, but at some point, it's not very British, is it? <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> well, unless you're born to rule, no. But um, at some point, we're just going to have to lead more uh, um, uh, enthusiastically, I think. Yeah, I'd more um, insistently. Well, the, the the factor is that you can't. All you can do is tell them the truth. Mm. You know, there's no. And you can shame them. The other thing you do is with rhetorical questions say, "Why haven't you done anything about this?" Yeah. Yeah, the, but the Dutch I are very good at this, I find. You know, they, they like blaming. Yeah, well, I you know, said... There's quite time and place for it. I said to my friends, I said, well, what are you going to do if your child turns around in another 20 years and says, what were you doing, Dad, when this happened? Yeah. What did you do? You know, it's, it, people, people have got to draw their own line. And my line was drawn a long time ago. I'm in this now. Whatever it, wherever it goes, whatever we do, I'm, I'm in it for... Well, a minute to win it because there's no alternative. No. If we don't, if we don't win, there's nothing. There's, there's not nothing going to be worth living for, because I know where this goes. I know where this system is taking us, and it's not to give you these nice free holidays, and it's not to make it so that you don't have to work. And you know, you, 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 it always comes back down to money. And as long as you yes. keep people desperate which is the fight or flight mechanism, isn't it, really, that everybody's kept in that permanent fight or flight, no matter mm -hmm. what. But that, this, that is another reason why there's so many, not only you're being poisoned in what you drink and what you eat, but that fight or flight is making you ill. Yes, you it might is. feel it, and, and you, you are causing illness by just worrying. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to then turn around to someone and say, well, just don't worry about it. That's not what, what this society does. You worry about everything. You, from waking up in the morning, you worry till, till night time. Where's this money coming from? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? When I let go of all that, things started to change for me, Alex. I, I, I calmed down. Things happened. When I stopped forcing it, things happened. Yes. And as I said, I've got in touch with so many people who've fed me um, nuggets of information that I've been able to put together. And, I've, you know, I've got a close group of lads that work uh, just on what we work in, which is mortgages, and we're, we're actually on with council tax now. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're working as just a small group of us, 
and it's what we concentrate on. But other people will give me something. And hey, what about this? We can use that here to to, to yeah. build it. And the stuff that people are giving me is just it's vital. You know, I mean, I've been, I've been thanked. Uh, there's so many people who thank me for what I did. You know, I, I've had people wait for me after talks and say, you changed my life. One fellow even said, I've saved his life. I went, I don't know how, because I was fighting for my life. I said, it's just this information. It needs to be known by everybody. Yes, yes. And, you know, th- th- for those thanks, it, it makes it, I wouldn't say it makes it worthwhile, because... You know, I'd rather somebody thank me and not have stolen the house. But that, <laughs> that, that, type, that type of stuff, it was, it's, it's heartwarming because there's good people that want to do the right thing. And if you've got good people wanting to do the right thing, give them the information where the right thing can be found. Yes. I, I can't say I've found the mechanism. I understand how it works, but I've not found some stuff. There's something missing. And that's, like I said, with their language, Alex, they, if, I, if I miss a full stop out of it, they can say, hey, that's, that's nothing that we can ignore it. You know, it, it, they, they play so many tricks with the, you know, there's, there's um, I don't know if you're aware of Jordan Peterson and the oh, new yes. group that he created in Canada. And it was about the taking the, I understood his arguments about controlling freedom of speech. Controlling the discourse, speech. yes. Yeah, the law was going to stipulate what you must refer to somebody as. So somebody was taking control of what I want to call Mm -hmm. them, because it might upset them. Well, do you know what? I don't give a shit whether Mm -hmm. it upsets you or not. I'm not doing that to intend. You shouldn't be taking control of my language. That is just one little step. And it was all about the compassion side. But it's taking control. We've seen where this goes, (laughs) Alex. We know what the control the control does, but then you've got these whatever they call them, social justice warriors who think mm. that you now having a go at transgenders or you're having a go at transvestites or you're having a go at gays or lesbians. I, I, I just don't get the mentality of what those people, their thought process. It makes complete sense. Yet they're standing there, not knowing. If this morning he was a bloke. This afternoon he's now a woman. Uh, I don't know what he was at dinner time. Maybe he was neither. I don't know. But the trans fluid stuff. And then you look in the, I'm reading articles where something like uh, up to 40, four to, uh, five to nine year old kids are taken to transgender clinics for counselling. I didn't know what bike I wanted to play on when I was seven. Never mind whether I, I knew I was a boy. I had mm. a penis. That, that was it for me. I don't need yeah. to know anything else. So right. to, to, to try and make an argument and point at it and say, look at this, look at this, it's the same old tricks that they've always used. Oh, yeah. You know, they, they, they've slaughtered it, in, but it, it's all backfired. It's the same with the Cappy, was it Cappy, o, uh, Cappy O'Brien, is it? Channel 4. Uh, yes, Cappy Newman. Cappy Newman. Yes. And she, I've, I, obviously I don't watch television, but when... She kept, so what you're saying is, so what you're saying is, no, that's what you're wanting him to say. I, I, I thought it's so blatantly obvious what you're doing there. What's interesting about that, Paul, is that uh, according to Jordan Peterson's testimony, she was perfectly chirpy before and after broadcast. But the moment they said we're on air, yeah. she turned into this attack dog. Yeah. You know, it was not that her mind had been fiddled with. It was a deliberate, cute attempt to misrepresent him. But that tells us something about the... Uh, uh, SJW mindset. Yes, it does. That's it. All these little things that I wouldn't have picked up on is like jumping straight out at you now, and you're thinking, can anybody else see this? Can mm. anybody else see what is what is going on? When it's pointed out, they understand it. They can see it. But as we were talking about before, all these distractions is the one thing that we're missing. I think we're missing a lot of different things, but. The, out of the Tommy Robinson stuff, people are asking, well, free speech, that's an attack on free speech, which is a legitimate argument. Yes, but, but, but if you say to... there's an attack on free speech, which is the, the, the most of the media outlets covering it from North America are going for that angle, you're uh, missing the point nearer the bone that it is an attack on due process yes. and our inalienable rights under common law, which is something North Americans ought to understand. But the kinds of outlets who are focused on it are 
mainly pro-Zionist, which is one of the reasons that they are quick to latch on to the, um, the free speech aspect. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I must admit, that's, that's the one thing that's been worrying me about the Tommy Robinson stuff, what his agenda is. There seems to mm. be an agenda behind him. And as you were saying, rightly so, I mean, I've seen him photograph in um, Israeli Defence Force t-shirts, standing on an Israeli tank with an M16. You know, these, th this man goes and be, can do, do that, yet he's from Luton, he's a, you know, he's, he's a town boy, he's got all the, there's something not right. You know, if it looks like shit, smells like shit, it's normally shit. And <laughs> there's something not right about the whole Tommy Robinson thing. Yeah. And it, it, um, I think it's probably at the level of people behind him. Um, I'm not going to champion him, but I think his first book, I know he's got another one out now, um, the way that's told, and I think David Scott's come to the same conclusion, uh, Brian Gerrish has read his book as well and is somewhat more sceptical, uh, but the way it's told makes it unlikely that the whole thing is uh, a complete invention, the whole story. There's too much passion, there's too much native intelligence in the lad, yeah. Yeah. and uh, he's got a, a sound head on his shoulders as regards world affairs and understanding yeah. human nature. And if you were a complete put-up job from my old colleagues, then the one thing that you wouldn't do is get the guy to write in his book, Special Branch tried to novel me and I said no. Yeah. You know, that would be a very clever operation indeed if that detail was in there. But it's at the level, I think, of the handlers behind him uh, at the Rebel Media and the other outfits he's involved with. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's, um, the, the, the coverage that he gets, you know, people, look how long the likes of Vanessa and Eva it took them ages to get onto mainstream. And, you know, their, their coverage of that war, mm. both with, in Gaza as well, though, that coverage is real. It's truthful. There's no sound bites. There's no manipulation of things. And, you know, as we've, we've heard so much about the white helmets, in the mainstream media, these people still talk about the prize winners. Yeah. You know, people, people, there's, there's almost like two versions of the truth now. The well, it's, it's modelled. It, with yeah. the mainstream media, it's a model that has to be protected yeah. because that's what is lucrative for the City of London people involved. And that's what has to be protected at all costs, as Vanessa Bile has said. So that's why they've come down on her, uh, particularly like a ton of bricks. Uh, is because uh, you know, I don't think they give a stuff about Syria and they've seen that that's a lost cause. Uh, but they wanted to replicate this model in Latin America and the Philippines. And mm -hmm. they can't do that if, if the masses are well aware of the, of the idea of white helmets before it appears in those other countries. It, well, it, it, it's, it never ceases to amaze me. We've got things like going on in Yemen and we're not, we're not fussed about that. But Syria, oh, big bad dictator. Look at what mm. he's doing. Oh, he's gassing his own people and all this rubbish. And yet we're selling arms to Saudi Arabia to genocide. Yes, and of course, uh, Boris Johnson was tackled about this. Uh, and his response was, if we don't do it, someone else will. <laughs> See, honestly, <laughs> you can't write this stuff. But the, somebody's no. writing it. Somebody's mm. writing it. Look at it. The, the, um, what's um, your take on the events in South Africa with the Boers? Yes, well, they're a complicated people, the Boers, because they're not just Dutchmen. Um, they, they have a mixture of French, German, everything in them. Uh, so they've got the various kinds of fighting spirits uh, of some of the best nations in Europe. Um, you know, there's this conflicting claims about Boer history, but generally they were more put upon. They were more sinned against than sinning. And we in Britain, of course, uh, well, it was really a private agenda by the Rhodes-Milner group. We sought to eradicate them because we knew that there was diamond. Or they, the, uh, the corporations knew there were diamonds under their territory. Yeah. Um, really, it's uh, the other thing I'd say about the uh, horrendous afflictions of the Boers now, apart from the, 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 the fact that it's a condemnation of the West uh, of Europe and Australia in particular, that they won't take in the Boers, despite this obvious threat to their lives, uh, is that it shows up the dirty deals that we cut with black Africa. Um, mm. Mugabe as well over the border in Zimbabwe is a case in point. Uh, in both cases, when we saw, uh, of course it started with the winds of change speech of Harold Wilson, the so-called socialist in 1964, where he delivered that speech in Johannesburg and said, we're not going to support uh, British common law rule anymore. You're going to have to go Marxist and black ruled. And of course it took a lot longer than that. Ian Smith in Rhodesia saw that happening. 
in 65. They declared independence unilaterally. Then you see the interesting thing, the, the city uh, and Londra and all the like uh, come down on Zimbabwe very hard for 15 years. And as we now know, uh, it was overtly uh, Chinese communists training and funding, but behind that there was Western elites um, money involved in training up that those incredibly brutal Danu PF guys um, to do hideous things to the white and non-combatant blacks in Zimbabwe and again in uh, in the Mandela period in South Africa. Uh, and then we, of course, uh, gave the franchise of running those countries for the beha on behalf of the city over to the new black rulers under the premise that they would be Marxist and believe and preach class struggle because that always suits uh, the rulers. It's, it's to divide and rule, you see. Yeah. That, that's the, the basic essence of what's happened, I think, is that the, the franchise has been given over to the blacks when it was inevitable, but it's, it's still uh, an arm of city operations, what's going yeah. on in Southern Africa. It's, it's not a genuine uh, revolution from the ground among the black people of South Africa or indeed of Zimbabwe. Well, they've always, it's always been uh, the West uh, plaything anyway, because it's probably the richest country in the world that's why it's been kept purposely poor and yeah absolutely so it was uh, South Africa is a, is a big development area for these uh, city shysters um i forget his name right now but there was a, a lawyer for uh unilaterally independent rhodesia uh who was at the lancaster talks in 1979 one of the properties that the deep state uses in london for these kind of conferences and he ended up being suicided out of a window during the conference giles i can't remember his surname but his christian name was giles and that kind of puts a, um, a, a you know, a, a ring around the most important events, really highlights the, the question of what was going on at Lancaster House. We get some clues because in 1997, uh, of course, it was the Tory grandees, the kind who are very close with the City of London, who took over power in 1979, just after that conference. And they had on it to 18 years of government in uninterrupted. 1997, Claire Short, uh, again, a very socialist la Labour MP, gets to become the Minister for International Development, Secretary of State, sorry, and writes to Mugabe and sets off all that uh, hell that broke loose in Zimbabwe inadvertently by writing to him and saying, we've taken over, we're not a government of Tory landowners, so all the deals cut in 1979 don't apply. And she probably meant it in an anti-Tory, somewhat populist, maybe understandable way, but this is when Mugabe thought, well, sod it, I'm going to, uh, to expropriate the whites, dispossess the Boers, although they don't call them Boers in South Africa, dispossess the whites, and, um, and flood the currents, uh, and then uh, devalue the currency to, to nothing, which happened again in 2008. And he did so because he got this letter from Claire Short, which said, uh, the way he read it at least, was the 1979 deal is off, and he read that as meaning you don't get the goodies anymore, you're out of the city's good books. Yeah. And that's yeah. when he turned, started got turning Chinese. And of course, <laughs> eventually the Chinese removed him in his dotage now this year. Cool. Cool. So that to me is a proof of uh, the city being in charge of it. Well, the, I think, it, isn't, it, um, isn't it right that the countries we're at war with are the ones that we don't control? <laughs> that's correct, yes. They're ones that don't have a Rothschild central blank. There's not many of them in, in exactly, the world anymore. Exactly. Did, um, have you um, caught this guy, is his name Roland Bernard? Oh yes, I've interviewed the gentleman. I've had him here in my house yes. interviewing him. Yes. What I could sit and listen to him for hours. To people should definitely go to the commission.intj.org uh, site or on YouTube, International Tribunal for Natural Justice, because uh, that's one of the uploads that's just come up. Very emotional testimony in English, in which is unusual for him. Half an hour where he goes into detail about his childhood, yeah. and says my my first nine years were hell. And then I got double hell because I was given to a Catholic institution where they abused us. And he said, when I came out of that, I was numb. And, I'd, and this is reinforced by others who spoke, like Karine Hutzabout, who's a criminologist who tries to sort out Belgian paedophiles in prison. And that they're saying the same thing. They're ahead of, the, of Britain in this regard. They've understood the psychology of, uh, of child abusers, especially, especially the ones who get to elite levels. And they've said, well, these people are raw and very afraid because they were abused themselves. And they, this is not in the least to excuse their abuse but it explains why they are trying to get back at the world, destroy everything innocent and beautiful. That's even before you bring Satanism into the equation. Even on the human level, that desire is there. And uh, they're just desperate to uh, reconnect with the, their lives and feel alive. Some of them turn to physical and sexual abuse simply in the way that people self-harm. Uh, same rationale, you know, pain makes them feel alive. And this is bred into them, isn't it, in these families, in these bloodlines? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, all the elite abusers are abused hideously as children, yeah. even though know, the very, very high up ones, especially then they're treated more mercilessly than the rest. Definitely, definitely. 
It's um, th some of the stuff that he was talking about, though. It 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 joins so many dots up for me from being theory, you know. To well, he, he's talking about you know the apex. If you listen to Justin Walker talk at that or any other at IMTJ or other events, he talks about the pyramid, the BIS at the top, the Bank yes. for International Settlement. And Bernard says that where other people stop, Bernard starts. You know, he says. I was the go-getter for the eight and a half thousand hedge fund guys and investment bankers who control the BIS, you know, wow. who give it its marching orders. That's the level. And he says, if you go one level above him, you're into, you know, sold out Satanism where you've signed in and there's not, there's not really a soul left. Uh, and you're irredeemable then. As, as you rightly say, if these people are looking to try and feel something back mm. in the lives, do you know what I mean? Because yes. if, you, if you're one without feeling, then how... how you know, well, I mean, if, if you're, you know, a big shot investment banker and you've got, you know, all the women in various states of undress uh, you want all day anyway, either your own uh, employees or whatever's laid on for you as entertainment, yeah. and you've got all the toys you could ever want to play with, yeah. nothing is exciting or unusual except, hideous as it may sound, fiddling around with children and torture. Yeah, and uh, animals are a big part of this as well. The British people are a great animal-loving nation. And Robert Green, uh, one of the greatest campaigners who's been to prison twice for this in Scotland because of the Holly Gregg case, yeah, quite yeah. correctly says we should make a lot more of the uh, massive scale of animal mutilation and sacrifice that goes on uh, in Satanism because that would really wake the British people up. I'm sorry to say almost more than child abuse would. I mean, it's not for nothing that we have a royal society for the prevention of cruelty to animals, but merely a national society for the prevention of cruelty to children. Yeah, and to yeah. boot, it's often accused of some people within the NSPCC of being gatekeepers for the abusers anyway. I agree. And it, so, it, again, it comes back to what would you want, what do you want to leave your kids? What mm. do you want to, to what, what would you like your kids to inherit? And, you know, we were talking, again, just going back to the, uh, the South African stuff, um, we had uh, Gordon Bowden on yes. this um, a couple of months back, and he was telling us about all the addresses that the, um, the, the that Finchley Road, all the businesses that were operating through there. Some were only open for a day, yet there was money in the the Anglesey Mining Company that doesn't have any mining equipment or employees. Yes. I've got a good group of, of Welshmen who are, I hope, going to move into looking at this. Most of them are in South Wales rather than Anglesey, but um, there's a lot more work needing doing there because Gordon's research has really uh, thrown up some very, very important questions well, it, it, about that. Because Anglesey mining, you know, that, that ties into child abuse and nuclear waste and all kinds of issues. Yes, it does. That's why, that's why I found it intriguing and he's a very, very knowledgeable fellow as well. He is, and, yes. It, he also uh, spoke at the INTJ. So yeah, everything, everything just seems, it just all seems to be pulling together at the right times, doesn't it? It does, it does. It's, um, I, I, I was, we, we've touched everywhere else, we might as well touch on in Europe now. Mm. Uh, obviously, you'll be aware of the Kalergi plan and things like that, talking about weaponized migration and, and, and being, the way it's being used. Um, I've got a friend who I work with who's a, a Swedish lad, and I, I remember we've been having a conversation for a while about it. And I said, "Have you seen the latest of what's happening in your country that police will not go into certain zones because it's not politically correct, and women, instead of being protected, are being issued with please don't rape me wristbands?" And he put his head in his hands and he went, "I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't mm. know what to say about my own country." And I said, well, that's coming here. That is coming here if people yeah. don't do something. And Europe, I mean, I've never seen how Germany's not turned itself over time and time again now because what they're doing to that country, it, it's not, it's a kind of genocide. Germany is bearing the brunt. And, you know, you, you'll know about not just Kalergi, but the post war plans, Morgenthau. Putin, and I've forgotten uh, to name the third right now, but there's, there was a, there was a sterilise them, there was a depopulate them, and yeah. a third one was mind control them. And the Dutch had a version of the plan called Black, Black Tulip, where they would seize half of northern Germany and Dutchify it, and the other countries around Germany would be allowed to do the same, so until Germany was basically only Hessia. So there, there's, um, there's all these plans, but the Germans have got their particular complexes, but when you pop over there, you do find that there's surprising numbers of men, again, of some real quality and determination from all walks of life, again, getting together privately as best they can, and on secure channels as well, talking about what to do. But of course, they're very afraid, afraid because of their own history of going the militia route, and it wouldn't be the right thing to do. 
Uh, but they're, they're pretty awake now, actually, most Germans, especially the under 40s. Uh, a good channel to follow in that regard is called um, Red Pill Germany. He talks from a particular MGTOW red pill man angle, but he's got a lot of good analysis on this. Good stuff. So, where would you see, where we're at now, where would you see this going in an ideal world? Because obviously, we're not going to just wake up tomorrow and everything's fixed. No. Where, where can you see this now? We, we alive at the moment are laying, saying, uh, sowing the seeds uh, yes. for a counter uh, action, I think, against all the things that are being done to us. And I think the rest of our lives, the, the best we can hope for is that with a lot of hard graft, we're going to recreate the people's sovereign institutions, which were, of course, created for us in centuries ago, which have been taken over. Yeah. And I think we're going to be spending the rest of our lives um, laying down common law mechanisms again, uh, our own educational uh, institutions, uh, taking back policing, reasserting our right to keep and bear arms, which is as, in, in, as inalienable and constitutional in uh, Britain as it is in this America. Uh, so we'll, we'll be you know, continuing to build our own media. Uh, there's, there's no hope, and above all, of course, a new monetary system uh, built on sound principles from, our, from ourselves with no involvement of the banking and insurance industry. Uh, that's enough for anyone to be getting on with in this lifetime, and I think our grandchildren are going to be the first to benefit from it. Yeah, I think um, taking control back of the money supply has got to be a, a, one of the first things that we do because, you know, when you see the likes of Hitler changing Germany from what it was after the Weimar Republic, mm. changing it into what he did in six years, and the basics of it was that um, issuing the credit within the, you know, within the nation and feeding the profits back into his country. You know, that that type of um, scenario for Britain, it would fix so many problems. You know that you've got a broken society when you're fining people for being homeless. Mm. You know, the, there's a guy in Bristol, the Bristol City Council, um, sentenced, well, took him to court and in breach of a court order, they, they jailed him. They jailed him for being homeless because he breached. And the council's reaction was, well, at least he's got somewhere to live. Dangerous precedents that were being set. Yeah. Dangerous precedents. Anyway, it looks like uh, we've come to the end of the show there, Alex. I could talk to you for hours, mate. Um, I hope you'll come back on sometime because oh, of course. knowledge, your knowledge is, it's uh, like I said, seeing you on the column and I think, then, hey, I'll, I'll have a look into that subject. And the, You know, they're really interesting and it adds um, background to the history. Mm. And I, I love I love history. So uh, thanks for taking the time to come on, Alex. You're very welcome, really Paul. It's been a great pleasure. Brilliant. Uh, is that over to you, Andy? Um, yeah, well, I'd just like to say uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to you two guys. Um, we've had a fantastic load of comments from Facebook and from the chat room. We've eventually got Spreaker working. So um, I'll I'll upload an audio file there and make that right so that the YouTube's right and all that kind of stuff. Um, brilliant night, everybody. Thanks. And we'll be back next week, yeah? Yeah. Oh, sorry, if, if you, unless you've got anything to wrap up with, Paul. No, I was only going to say, um, I'm not sure if Jason, uh, with him being not too well, whether he's got any uh, plan for Monday, but John Wedge is going to be on the show next Tuesday, who is um, ex-Metropolitan Police, and he's going to be discussing uh, police cover-ups of um, paedophile rings that knock, knocks on Westminster, I should add. Nice one, so Paul. That's, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, once again, Alex, thanks. Thanks so much. And I look forward to speaking to you again in the future, pal. Cheers. Thanks very much to you both. Thanks, Good Alex. Night. Cracking yeah. guest, mate. Right. Cheers, Alex. See you. Good night, Jen. Thanks. There we go. Thanks very much. Whoa. Oh, better put Facebook Live off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Good night, Facebook Live. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next week. In a bit.